Not to cite any more examples, I read to you Hebrews 11. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, that's particularly gruesome, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And then come the most poignant words in our text, and let me read them to you. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, he said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. In this parable we have presented before us the murder of Jesus Christ by the Jews. It was the product of a conspiracy. They said among themselves, come, let us kill him. But in those days in Jerusalem, and Jesus well knew it, the wicked religious leaders were plotting to have him put to death. And he says this in their hearing. The reason presented here for their murder of the Son of God was that they wanted to save their own leadership positions. And even better them. Let us seize on his inheritance. If we can kill the Christ, we will then have the government of the church to ourselves. And we won't have the Son of God coming and telling the truth and making us look bad. We'll possess it all in peace. We'll put him to death. Good idea. Then they excommunicated Christ. Because remember, they called him a false prophet or a blasphemer excommunicable offences and they had him executed outside the walls of Jerusalem they caught him verse 39 says and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him and then Jesus asks the simple question when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh what will he do to these husbandmen what do you think? And his hearers have been so engrossed with the story and inflamed with anger that they say in indignation, well, he's going to miserably destroy those wicked men. He's going to lease out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which will which do their job properly and pay the man for, for the land which he has granted to them. And they were caught out of their own lives miserably destroy those wicked men the eternal punishment of these ungodly Jewish leaders let out the vineyard unto other husbandmen other church leaders will be appointed and it's just this is the right thing to do this is just what these men have coming to them so God says in the parable through Jesus and this is what the unbelieving Jews who listened to the story themselves said, Jesus didn't even say, what, he, what, what do you think he's going to do? Yeah, he'd be quite right in doing that. That would be the appropriate thing to do. Even his enemies admitted this would be fair and proper. In the remaining verses, Christ interprets, expands, sharpens, and applies some of the points of the parable using a different image. He's not now talking about tenant farmers in a vineyard. It's a stone. It's a stone. Did you not ask? Did you never read in the scriptures, he asks? That's his question. 
Did ye never read in the scriptures? The Pharisees, you know, must have hated these questions that Jesus asked because he didn't ask simple, harmless questions merely for information when he dealt with these vipers. He asked questions deliberately, this is righteous on his behalf, deliberately to expose, refute, and condemn them. Did ye never read in the scriptures? And the warning lights will be flashing here. He's always asking us about these sort of things. What else did we read in the Bible? And he's saying thereby, your problem is, you don't really read the Word. That is, you don't understand it. Have you never read? Maybe you should think about this particular text that applies to the situation now in hand. Did you never read in the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same as made the head of the corner, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Did you never read that? Do you know what it means? And you see the parable, and now this quotation of Psalm 118 and Christ's comments upon it, they both shed light on each other. Who is the son slain by the tenant farmers? Who is the stone rejected by the builders? The same person, the Lord Christ. And see what Christ is saying to them. I know, I know that you're going to kill me. I know that you are already plotting to kill me. I know this. And I'm letting you know that I know. You know. This is what you're up to. Then the question is, well, if Jesus is the, the sun and the stone, who are the tenant farmers? And who are the builders? And it's the religious leaders, and they twig that too. Again, I quote verse 45, When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he speak of them. What's going to happen to the tenant farmers? He will miserably destroy those wicked men. And what's going to happen to the builders? Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Verse 44. They're going to be pulverized. Sometimes people have the idea that the parables of Christ are nice, soft, bedtime reading, as it were, pulverized the religious leaders who reject Christ. That's a strong word. And what about that stone? What happens it? Here's the stone. The builders, who are the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they come, look at the stone. You can see them, I think, a church building site. Not now with bricks, but made something more like Solomon's temple with huge stones. They look at this stone, they peer at it from side to side. Ah, it's no good, that stone. It doesn't fit. You couldn't build God's church with a stone like that. And so they reject it, put a little chalk mark on it, as it were, and say, that one's no good, cart that one away, dump it. God comes along and looks at the same stone that they've th rejected and thrown away and says, now there's a good stone. This is too good a stone to put in the building as a brick, let's say, in the wall. This stone is the chief cornerstone. I'm going to erect the whole of my church upon this stone and build the holy Catholic Church of Christ upon two very different identity. One, it's not even fit to go in the building. It ought to be excommunicated this Jesus. Murder. But the other one, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm going to erect the whole edifice on this stone that you in your great wisdom rejected as unworthy. 